Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, we're going to have an interview with Dr. Eric Zielinski on essential oils. And my goals for the podcast episode today are to learn a bit more about what essential oils are and how they can be used in the treatment of specific chronic diseases like sleep disorders, Alzheimer's, diabetes, osteoporosis, heart disease, and even cancer, among others. As Dr. Zielinski points out in his new book, The Essential Oils Apothecary, Soothing Remedies of Anxiety, Pain, High Blood, high blood Sugar, Hypertension, and Other Chronic Conditions, essential oils are neither essential nor oils. <laughs> mm -hmm. They are actually volatile, volatile organic compounds and they are the components of the plant that are released into the air when you smell, say, lavender. But they are oil-soluble compounds, so they're used in a carrier oil like olive oil. But we'll ask Dr. Zelensky to explain more how essential oils are made and work and how they are different than herbal supplements. Our guest today is Dr. Eric Zelensky, who is a doctor of chiropractic, a natural health guru, and a best-selling author with his wife, Sabrina Ann Zielinski. Dr. Zielinski is the author of The Healing Power of Essential Oils, which has sold over 200,000 copies. Dr. Zielinski, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Dr. Ben, thanks for having me. I got to say, I have big shoes to fill. Not many people can boast a hundred five-star reviews. You don't even have a negative review on your podcast here. So I better not screw up. If I, if I screw this thing up, you, 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 you know, you just, you, you take it out of my pay, right? How much are you paying me for this? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fortunately I have a hundred relatives and friends, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I love um, that. How many wives um, and kids do you have? Yeah. <laughs> So that's so funny. Let's start by explaining what is an essential oil and how it's ah, made. I'm so glad you mentioned that. They're not essential. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Who, who would have thought of that? Yeah, question? is that you? You know, I'm not, you mentioned something though. They're not essential and they're not oil. I mean, it's they're named essential oil because they're known as the as the essence of flavor and aroma of plants. So when you put your nose into a rose and those volatile organic compounds are being emitted from the rose, you smell it. And just to get, go back to biochemistry for people who might forget volatile, volatile meaning readily evaporate at, at ambient room temperature. So that means when you spray your Febreze a hundred feet away in a, in a room and you smell it like 10 minutes later, it's because those particles are floating. Organic, again, volatile organic compounds, organic meaning carbon-based, and compound meaning Floating there's particles. A, I got to get my mask. No, I'm kidding. Yes. Uh, yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> and compound meaning there's a lot of chemicals, meaning there are a lot of components to it. So I'm holding up a bottle that's used, almost done. It's my favorite blends here. And you're looking at 150 to 200 different plant chemicals. And like, what do you mean plant chemical, Dr. Z? Well, You've heard of menthol, I'm, I'm assuming, right? Eucalyptus menthol. What's in your Vicks Vapor Rub? What's in your Bengay? What makes your pain relieving stuff good? Well, people focus on menthol. So they extract the menthol from the peppermint and they create a drug out of it. Same thing with pinene, limonene, eugenol, carvacrol. And one thing, I mean, just let's call out the elephant in the room. Drugs today highly are based off of the chemical constituency that we see in plants. It's not like a chemist or a pharmacist wakes up in the middle of the night with a vision thinking, oh, if we combine carbons and hydrogens and, and oxygens in a certain way, it'll create this structure. No, I mean, what we see is what we have in nature. And that's the basis for virtually every drug on the market. And the best example is, is willow. For years, thousands of years, our ancestors have used willow bark for its analgesic pain relieving property. It is a potent anti-inflammatory. They made pulses and salves and creams and all kinds of stuff out of it. Well, there's a chemical in it. 
It's a salicylin in the salicylate family. If you extract that out, if you manufacture it synthetically, mass produce it, put some preservatives and a white shiny coating, it's sold as aspirin. It's literally aspirin. Same thing with your antibiotics. Same thing with your metformin, your diabetes drug. Same thing with your cancer medication. I want to stress the importance here. I love aromatherapy for the smell and the feel and getting in the mood for me and my wife to enjoy a nice evening together. That's all great. But what I'm talking about is medicine, actual, like let's treat disease, let's prevent chronic conditions. And that's the basis for this recent book that we published, Advanced Strategies and Protocols for Chronic Disease and Conditions that are Robbing People of the Abundant Life. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about all the different compounds. They just recently had a discussion on the podcast um, uh, uh, with Dr. Pizzorno, and he did a lecture at the IFM's annual meeting on unimportant molecules. And he was talking about the fact that how we, we analyze foods and we came up with like, say, 45 different vitamins and minerals yeah. and basically said, those are the only important compounds mm. in, in food. And, and now when you go back and you analyze all these phytochemicals, there's 50,000 chemicals in food. Yes. And many of them have health promoting properties. We have flavanols and we have carotenoids and on and on and on. And so when you have an essential oil, you have all of these phyto chemicals. They're, they're actually known as bioactive compounds. Okay. And so a bioactive compound is a secondary metabolite. So the primary metabolite of photosynthesis and plant, plant biology are your things that you need to live, your, your vitamins, your minerals, your carbs. See, here's the thing. That's why they're not essential, right? And we should go back to our little, they're not essential. You don't need essential oils to live. You technically don't need fiber to live. You don't need antioxidants to live. You need carbs, proteins, vitamins, and minerals, or you will die. Now that's, that's the difference, essential nutrient versus non-essential, but non-essential nutrition, including essential oils, including those bioactive compounds are what give you health. So imagine a life without antioxidants, imagine a life without fiber, imagine a life without polyphenols and carotenoids and all those thousands of chemicals. That's where sickness and disease come into play. So when you're looking at a nutrition label, it's completely useless. The only thing I look at a label for, to let me know what the ingredients are. Everything else is useless, in my opinion. And so that's where you start focusing on, okay, what really is important? So that going back to this bioactive compound mentality is, is this mindset, okay, what do I need to live? I got that. You're going to get that basically. You, you're not going to become carb or protein or fat deficient living in America or most industrial countries. You're going to get that stuff. You're going to get your basic vitamins and minerals. Very few people are dying of scurvy and vitamin deficiency in our nation. Like we could talk about the connection between vitamin deficiency and death, but I'm just talking at a core level. You're going to get basically the stuff that you need, but what's going to make you healthy? What's going to make you be able to fight disease? What's going to give you an immune system? What's going to help you live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle so that when infection does come in, when you are exposed to X, Y, Z virus or whatever it is that's out there. How are you, is your body going to respond? And so to me, I'm glad you mentioned that because yes, we've majored on the minors and we've made, you know, ants out of molehills kind of thing. And it's like, okay, how do we get back to the basics? And when you look at plant chemistry, you realize, you know what? There's a lot out there that we're taking for granted. And that I'll propose this. This is my big sales pitch in my books and my blogs and my classes. Here's what I'm trying to sell. Again, I'm not a snake oil salesman. By the way, I don't even sell these oils. That's my secret. I don't sell them. I just educate. So now I could be, as I was taught in public health school, an unbiased researcher. And that's important to me. So I don't sell them. I'm not going to peddle. I'm not going to invite you to my multi-level marketing party. Bless their hearts. I love it. So my best friends are the top ranked representatives of these companies making millions of dollars. Good for them. But I'm just trying to teach you how to look at a lifestyle. And this is my big sales pitch here to look at the a lifestyle a little bit differently. And I want to propose an essential oils lifestyle. I want to propose when you look at your life, what is your toxic burden? Are you inundating yourself to things airborne, topical through what you eat that are causing a metabolic burden on your life? Are, are you poisoning yourself at a microscopic level without even realizing it? And once you start to look at your life and once you start to look at the things that you use and buy and consume, here's something that most people don't know. 
is that you are surrounding yourself and are surrounded by essential oils all day long. For example, what do you think flavors your Coca-Cola? What do you think flavors any processed food? Whether it's a natural flavoring or an artificial flavoring, it's either a synthetic essential oil or an actual essential oil. What do you think is the aroma in your Febreze or your plug-in or your wallflower or your candle? What do you think makes your cleaner so effective? Your goo gone. What's in your body care that gives it the aroma? Essential oils are everywhere. And it's like, wow, I never thought about that. And once you start thinking about it, like how ubiquitous they are, you start to look at what's the true danger with synthetically manufacturing these plant chemicals and inundating our bodies with it. And you start to realize here's the dangerous thing about the essential oil and, and the synthetic version of it, because we talked about them being um, volatile organic compounds. They're, they're lipophilic hydrophobic, meaning they're fat loving, water hating. They will penetrate into your bloodstream within minutes and seep through your, into your cellular level. Like they will penetrate your whole life, your whole body. You inhale them immediately. Your brain's impacted. There's no thalamic relay. What's that? It's a fancy way of saying when you smell something, it immediately impacts your brain, the smell, unlike the sensation of pain. So go back to the last time you might've accidentally hurt yourself, stubbed a toe, cut your finger, chopping carrots. Remember that split second of did I really hurt myself? Ooh, I did. There is no split second. When you inhale something, there is no relay center and interpretation center in the thalamus, a part of your brain. So when you inhale something, it says a, it sends a direct signal. Your olfactory system sends a direct signal to your brain where your limbic system is, your mood, your memory, your emotions are housed there. Autonomic function is controlled there. Heart rate, breathing rate, which is smart. When you look at it as a Christian, it's awesome. I say it's God's design from an evolutionary perspective. It makes sense. So when you smell smoke, you get in this fight or flight state, the sympathetic state, you get all high alert immediately, you get out of dodge. Well, that's, that's the power of smell. But essential oils, when you look at that, have such an impact on the body that when you flip it on its head, you start to realize what does the fake essential oil do to me? What do this synthetic fragrances do to me? And that is where we, I get shaken in my boots. Because artificial fragrances, doc, are linked to neurological inflammation. Alzheimer's, cancer, dementia, autoimmunity, and of course, the quote minor things like ADHD, learning disabilities, um, um, you know, COPD, um, um, asthma, that, that's the minor stuff, right? But you say that to someone who suffers with that, it's debilitating. Artificial fragrances are killing people all day long. Artificial and, flavors and are part how, of it. How common are artificial fragrances? Yeah. Everywhere. It's everywhere. Right, right. Everything you smell and see that you remember you're old enough and I'm old enough to remember when soap didn't smell like anything. It was soap, right? It, people that people that have been around for a while, you remember when there weren't all these fake smells everywhere. And, and when's the last time you've been to, let's say a restroom, a public restroom. And we, we frequent, um, public gas stations because we travel a lot, right? So we're traveling, my family and I take road trips up to Michigan, down to Florida, we live in Georgia. And I can't tell you how many times I'm in the gas station restroom taking a pit stop with the kids. And I hear this, psst, psst, psst. And they're like, what in the world's happening? I look in the corner, oh, someone's spraying me with an artificial fragrance to make the poo-poo smell good. They're poisoning us. It's like fumigating in the bathroom. Like I can't handle but gag. You know, you want a cool tip? People are like, well, I mean, it's okay. It doesn't bother me. If you are not bothered by artificial fragrances, if you could walk in the bed, bath and beyond or bath and body works, if you could go into the cleaning aisle in Walmart and not get sick, not get a headache, if you don't get a runny nose, if you don't sneeze, that's a problem. That's synonymous to being like a diet, having diabetic neuropathy where you don't feel pain. And next thing you know, you have a sore in the bottom of your feet that can end up with gangrene and can get amputated because pain is a sensation that tells you there's something wrong. If you put your hand into a fire and keep it there, it will burn off. And that's exactly what's happened with our sense of smell. And we become desensitized to it from birth. From birth, you're born in a sterile environment with all these fake chemical smells at birth. 99% of kids born in the hospital. And then they go home with all these fake smells. Mama is filled with perfume and all this beautiful stuff that makes her smell good. Wow. 
what does that do to our sense of smell, the primal sense that we have to protect ourselves? And what does it do to the brain? And you wonder, you wonder why autism, you wonder why learning disabilities, we wonder why dementia and Alzheimer's is on the rise. We're causing brain inflammation. And that is why I'm trying to propose and sell everyone on this idea of this essential oil lifestyle is you are using and being and eating and surrounding yourself with essential oils all day long. You don't even realize it. Start to think about it and start to fix it where you're replacing the fake with the real and you'll find your body will respond wonderfully. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but I'd like to take a minute to tell you about a new product that I'm very excited about. I'd like to tell you about a new wearable called the Apollo. And this is a device that can be worn on the wrist or the ankle, and it uses vibrations to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And this device has amazing benefits in terms of uh, getting you out of that stressed out sympathetic nervous system and stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. It has a number of different functions, especially helping you to relax, to focus, to concentrate, to get into a deeper meditative state, even to help you sleep. And there's even a mode to help you wake up. And this all occurs through the uh, scientific use of subtle vibrations. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in getting the Apollo for yourself to help you uh, reset your nervous system, go to apolloneuro.com and use the um, affiliate code WHITES10. That's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z-10. And now back to the discussion. Um, so how do essential oils differ from herbal medicine? Simple word is concentration. Um, you can't find essential oils in nature. Think, I think it's important to recognize that. They're 100% natural, but they're still manufactured. So again, pulling up my, my or picking up my little bottle here, if you're listening, you can't see it, but I'm just holding up a, a bottle of essential oil. You're looking at roughly like three pounds of lavender flowers, steam distilled. Again, where are you going to see a pool of lavender? In nature, you're not you're not going to go into a rose garden like oh there, there's a beautiful rose essential oil let me let me touch it. it doesn't exist so I love herbs and I love herbalism I love spices and we love supplements all that stuff but they're very minor when it comes to the therapeutic efficacy essential oils have true pharmaceutical grade effect on the body nothing nothing can no herb no spice no supplement no food can compare to the therapeutic efficacy that essential oils can have simply by virtue of the concentration matter. And that's important to realize because one drop will have the effect of, let's say your blood, uh, your blood sugar, let's say cinnamon, great example. Cinnamon is highly effective at helping balance blood sugar, help increase insulin sensitivity, but just one or two drops, just drops of cinnamon bark essential oil has the same equivalency of, of two to three teaspoons of cinnamon bark powder. And how do you compare? So that's it. It's true concentration, very similar, but also there's a different chemical constituency because when you steam distill plant matter, you only get the volatile components. Again, those that are, that evaporate those heavier components. Um, we're again, we're getting deep in the, in the chemistry and plant biology here, but there are, there are chemicals that are too heavy. Those won't go through the steam distillation process. And a perfect example is frankincense as and boswellia, boswellic acids. A lot of people use boswellic acid for its pain relieving cancer fighting property. A lot of supplements have BAs, boswellic acids in them. Your frankincense oil won't have boswellic acid in it. So what does that mean? As a researcher, as a consumer, you're like, okay, what essential oil um, do I want to use? Let's say for, let's throw out breast cancer. And you see a study that says, oh, frankincense has a property that could help with breast cancer. And the, the researchers pull, oh, it's because of the boswellic acid. Well, that doesn't apply to my world. And the reason why I'm sharing that is because there's a lot of mismanaged and misappropriated research out there and very well-intentioned bloggers that are saying, hey, frankincense is great for XYZ because of the boswellic acids, but it's like, well, there are no boswellic acids in the essential oil. So the reason I'm sharing that with you is because when you extract something through steam distillation or solvent extraction, you're getting a different constituency. The plant is so 
it has a myriad of different ways that we could use the plant, whether you use a bark or a leaf, whether it's steam distilled or solvent extracted. It's wonderful. Like cannabis oil is not the same as cannabis essential oil or CBD, completely different products, all kind of oily based from marijuana plant, completely different chemical structures. So that means you just kind of learn what's what. And quite frankly, most people aren't willing to put the time and the effort, and I don't expect them to, to dive into this stuff. That's why I think so many people buy our books because I do the research. I've gone to aromatherapy school. I've laid it out. I'm like, okay, this is what you use for this. This is what you consider for that. And let's, let's try to make this a little bit simpler. And I know your, your audience is, is, dare I say, a little more advanced or educated than the average. So I'm, I'm talking in a way that I typically don't talk a lot because I understand I'm, I've seen the previous guests and, and, and I know what you offer. In functional medicine, we need to step up and we need to recognize one size does not fit all. And we need to look at essential oils as a key part of this, this, this tool belt that we need to treat and help so before people. Before we get into specific conditions, would you say that, um, let's say we're treating a patient for a specific chronic condition, um, would essential oils be something that we would add to our herbal protocol? Would you recommend using them in place of it? Would, would it be, it, it seems to me it would make sense to add it as an additional component in the treatment plan. Yeah, it, it would be, what I would do, is I would look at an essential oil before I would look at a pharmaceutical. Right. Like that's how I want people to look at it. So right. your herbs right. are always there, but that's what I mean. Your, your yeah. herbs are always there. Your supplements are always there. Right. It's just now when in the protocol, do you be like, okay, we need something stronger now. Like that's where the essential oil comes into play. And I, it's kind of like a first step. If we were going to look at it first for people that with minor issues, you could try, you could try herbs if you want. Um, or some people go right to the aspirin. It my, my, the easiest thing is my medicine cabinet has no pharmaceuticals in it at all. No over the counter. It's filled with essential oils. Like that to me is the protocol in my life is if I need something of that nature. Um, otherwise, if I have, you know, it, it, there is this, there is this compounding effect, like going back to frankincense. I do want boswellic acids in my life. I do want herbs. I do want spices. I do want supplements. So you, you use them in conjunction with essential oils only though, here's the thing, only if you want that level of therapeutic efficacy. And I think that's important because I don't use essential oils because I have to. I use essential oils because I want to currently because I'm not sick. And, and let me clarify, I'm not like taking a multivitamin verse like of, of, of essential oils. I, I don't take a drop of frankincense every day to, to prevent cancer. I don't live like that. That's not my philosophy. I use essential oils going back to my lifestyle approach. It's in my body care because I don't use the fake fragrances. It's in my food because I don't use the fake flavoring. I like it behind me um, in my diffuser because I don't like the fake aerosols and my body just loves it. So we use essential oils all day long, but when it comes to like actual preventing or treating disease, that's where it's like, okay, it's a different mindset. And again, I don't, I don't take cinnamon oil to balance my blood sugar because I'm not pre-diabetic or diabetic. But if I were, then that's when I would look at it in conjunction with herbs and other treatments. Um, a lot of people, quite frankly, they don't even bother with, with once they reach a certain level, a certain stage of their condition, it, it, the, the minimum efficacy that a supplement or an herb can have, they'll go right to the essential oil. Because again, you can't compare. It's just who wants to take 15 pills of a, of a turmeric when you can just have like two drops of an essential oil. Like that's how concentrated these are. And when you use them in a medicinal dose, then you understand it, it is that level. So a lot of folks, if they have low grade issues, they don't even bother with the essential oil because their eating habits, their stress relieving habits or whatever there is, their supplement habits, protocols will help. So I guess that's want to paint that picture is when it comes to ingesting, that's the key. Ingesting essential oils, you only, only ingest essential oils medicinally when you want that true pharmaceutical grade punch. And so I know we're going to talk about aromatherapy, which is uh, our topic for today. But in terms of ingesting essential oils, are they typically put into a capsule or do you put some drops in a, in a glass of water or what form are they ingested? Yeah. And actually, let me, I'm glad you said that. Let me correct you. This is aromatherapy. 
See, isn't that interesting? This is the misnomer. I'm so glad you said this. People think aromatherapy, they only think of smelling pretty stuff. Aromatherapy is a therapeutic use of aromatic compounds. So how you use essential oils, depending on what method will determine your, your aromatherapy response. So aromatherapy is ingesting it. Aromatherapy is topical application. Aromatherapy is inhaling it. So that's where we got to get out of this mindset of like, oh, I just go to the store to get something smelly and nice. Like that, that is ancient aromatherapy because quite frankly, and let's be real, our ancestors didn't have essential oils like we have them today. And how do I know that? Well, steam distillation wasn't invented till the 9th century AD by Arab alchemists. So again, my well-intentioned multi-level marketing friends who are Christian saying, oh, Jesus used frankincense and myrrh, right? Gold, it's Christmas time right now coming up here. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know how many times I've been told people are convinced that Jesus used frankincense oil? No way. It was impossible. Why? There was no way for them to extract it. So when you think about where we're at today, traditional aromatherapy used to be burning leaves and incense. Cool. But, and then they got smart. Our ancestors started to put um, um, aromatic plants in, in oil. I like actually coming from the Bible, God told Moses, Hey, get this big old vat of olive oil, put some myrrh, calamus, cinnamon, cassia, and, and curry, and just let that steep and hang out for a while. AKA he gave them an anointing oil recipe, which was an herbal extract, extracting out some of the essential oil in this wonderfully beautiful aromatic experience. That was aromatherapy. And like, why would God do that? Well, I don't know, but I'll tell you, they were sacrificing animals, blood sacrifices. There's a lot of risk for infection. And there's very few things, by the way, that are antimicrobial, like essential oils. This stuff kills MRSA on contact. I mean, what kills MRSA? antibiotic resistant bacteria. What kills antifungal resistant fungi? Essential oils. There is no known resistance to them, to anything on the planet. That's why researchers today are looking at Carvacrol, which is a primary component of oregano to help with COVID. Hey, this is very cool preliminary research. No one's making claims that COVID is going to cure the pandemic, but the researchers, medical researchers saying, look, we know the benefits of using Carvacrol for destroying bacterial cell walls and also to kill viruses. We should look at Carvacrol, AKA oregano oil to help with COVID-19. The research is being done as we speak. So this is pretty cool stuff when you look at it. So all that to say, when you ingest essential oils, there's two primary ways of doing it. Going back to your Coca-Cola, your peppermint patties, your flavored ice cream, that's what's known as a culinary dose, like very, very minor, like one drop of oregano in your, in your spaghetti sauce. That's enough like that, that, but it gives you a nice minor. It's kind of like herbs. It's just like using, we, that's our, that's our, our substitution guide is, is if a recipe calls for one to two, let's say teaspoons of an herb a spice or a zest, like a lemon or orange zest, just use one drop of oil. Like that's a literal substitution in your recipe. But what it does, it has such a powerful antioxidant punch, antiviral punch that the herb doesn't have. And that's, that's the culinary dose. But if you want a true medicinal dose, yes, you need a gel capsule. You need to have, I recommend a vegan gel capsule. If you're treating the gut, for those people, excuse me, for those people who are trying to look at minimizing, managing, or even hopefully reversing the symptoms of SIBO, Crohn's, um, irritable bowel, leaky gut, you need an enteric coated capsule, which is a fancy way of saying it's a polymer time release capsule. So when you take the capsule, your body won't digest it until it gets down to your intestines. So that's how you literally treat gut issues because the gut is distal colon. And there's research sharing, suggesting, proving three to six drops of peppermint essential oil, going back to peppermint, can help soothe the symptoms and help people with SIBO. And they've done actual research up to that level. So in our book, we take what traditional aromatherapy has taught. We take what we know from the biochemistry. We take what we also know of the metabolic pathways of how drugs are metabolized. And we share um, um, dosing requirements. And typically when you're dosing internally, you're looking at three to six drops in a capsule. Um, and it's, it's potent topical. I want to point out topical aromatherapy is think transdermal patch, right? Pain patches. Now nicotine patches. We, we, we've seen this for years. We know that chemicals seep through the skin 
and get into the bloodstream to have a, a, a therapeutic effect. The same thing with essential oils. So what we try to do is teach people the safe way of diluting them and making salves. Again, this is a huge different strategy than I want to smell good. And we don't get me wrong. Our body care is all with essential oils, all of it, because we want to smell good, but we also like that nice minor medicinal, just a happy, feely good thing. But when something goes wrong, I have an infection or we're trying to treat something or whatever it might be, a headache, a migraine, we know to up the dose to a certain level. And now we get that therapeutic effect. Cool. Um, so uh, let's start with sleep. How can essential oils be helpful in promoting quality sleep? Yeah, instantly, instantly can put you in the parasympathetic state, instantly. So, so what would you recommend for sleep? Yeah, traditionally, lavender is a good start. You know, Doc, one thing I love about essential oils, and again, there's a lot of things we do. I mean, you know, we're, we're the granola, hippie, urbanite, yuppie people that give birth at home. Like that's me and my wife and our family. Um, there's a lot that we do. Um, but when it comes to it, a lot of the things that your other guests are sharing besides forest bathing, by the way, that was a great interview. Um, essential oils are forest bathing, by the way. I mean, that's a whole nother. What do you think makes forest bathing so potent and so healthy and so helpful? Like primarily the volatile organic compost being made from the plants. Right. So one thing that's really important is that when you look at this discussion, you start to realize, okay, I need to find something that works for me. And maybe lavender is the, a right approach, or maybe I should try something else. But I digress. What, what, the one thing that I, I want to encourage people with is unlike, and again, this is my sales pitch. I got I to do it. Unlike a lot of the things that we learn and a lot of the wonderful things that your experts and other guests have showed, what is easier, literally easier and even cost-effective than getting a 10 or $15 bottle of lavender putting two or three drops in a diffuser and press on right before you go to bed. Like there is zero barrier to entry, right? Es essential oils are the gateway to natural health, natural living, just like cigarettes are the gateway to drugs, right? That's all that, that is, I want it to impress everyone how easy this is. So nothing on the planet is as easier or cost-effective than getting a couple drops, putting in a diffuser, pressing on, done. So that's what you do. You get a water diffuser, 15, 20 bucks on Amazon, get a good essential oil. Again, I show with you um, how to find a good essential oil. That's a whole nother discussion, but there are a lot of fakes out there. There are a lot of you know, counterfeits. You got to find the real deal. Once you get one, a couple drops of lavender, wonderful. Now, if you have a little more on your budget, and I, I want to recognize we have five kids. I get it. Not everyone has a blank check. Vetiver, Roman chamomile, they're super effective, but they can get a little pricey. So what are other oils you could use? Well, geranium, clary sage. A lot of women like these oils. They're, they're traditional women's health oils. They're wonderful for calm and peace. Again, they, they, when you breathe these in, these volatile organic compounds, and you automatically get in that parasympathetic state. It's instant. So that would be a good way of starting. Um, some of the, going back to the tree oils and forest bathing, all those oils can help. Pine, frankincense, sandalwood, cedarwood, anything with a wood at the end of it. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, way. And that's just aromatic. That's just through the uh, aromatic compounds being emitted from the diffuser. But if you really want to get into it and that doesn't help you enough, that's where you could use a topical application and giving yourself a neck rub or a foot rub. That's where taking an actual like lavender capsule can give you that. Like if you're, if you're overdosing on a melatonin supplement, just get through the night, you might need something a little more, I don't know, dare I say stronger. You might need a stronger approach at first um, until you get so sensitive to just smelling lavender where it just puts you right there. Um, so I want to ask next about, um, the use of essential oils for dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to say, be, be, before you answer that question in your chapter on that, I noticed that you wrote that we should think twice before using hand sanitizer, because it might increase the risk of brain inflammation because of damage to our microbiomes. And mm. all I could think is, boy, there's very well might be a huge increase in the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's as a result of the massive use of hand sanitizer in the last two years. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was tough to get in the book. Actually, my, my publisher wanted to cut that part out, and I wrote this book in quarantine. Um, it was the very beginning of lockdown, quarantine, and COVID, two thousand nineteen. Or I'm sorry, 2020. So uh, when I wrote this book, I just, again, my job's easy. I, I'm, not, I'm not a practicing aromatherapist. I'm not a practicing chiropractor. I'm a researcher and I'm an I'm a, I'm a author, I'm a speaker. And I just, I share what the researchers say. So this is the easiest thing. Like, I'm like, look, a couple of years ago in Oxford University Journal, again, this ain't, I love aromatherapists, but you know, they have a, they have a stigma of being hippies that smell like patchouli. So the medical world and a lot of people just marginalize them. Oh, that's pseudoscience, right? We get that as chiropractors, that's pseudoscience. Oxford University is in pseudoscience of any sort. It's the premier university on the planet, right? Next to Harvard and Yale, whatever your ranking is. There's a journal called Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health that found a strong link between over-sanitized, wealthier countries and higher rates of Alzheimer's. They conducted this study over 192 countries, basically the whole world. And they found the more sanitized a country is, the higher the rates of Alzheimer's, like a linear, a linear relationship. Now, note, I didn't use the word. This is really important. It's not a play on words. I'm not trying to be smart here. I didn't say clean. I said sanitary. All right. Huge difference. Soap and water will get your hands clean. But if you want to quote, sanitize your hands, you need something else. And the problem is we've over sanitized our life to the point where we've literally destroyed. And the researchers concluded, why is the lack of bacteria on your hands? And this is really hard for some people to conceptualize. Please bear with me. There is a gut microbiome. I know you've had a lot of your speakers talk about this in the past. There's also a skin microbiome and there's a brain microbiome. What do you think makes us who we are? So when we have a lack of bacteria on our hands because of hand sanitizer, it's been linked to a poorly developed immune system, which puts your brain at risk for brain inf in neurological inflammation. I mean, are you serious? Now, when you compound that with fake chemicals and toxic, toxic chemicals, cleaning products and artificial fragrances that directly put the brain in neurological inflammation, it's no wonder that we're in the cognitive state that we are and we're decreasing rapidly. Why? Because we spend a vast majority of our time indoors. I mean, before I wrote this book, the, the, the most recent research we had was a couple of years ago when the Environmental Protection Agency was clear and they said, look, we spend 93% of our time indoors. And the reason they're sharing that is the air inside of our houses are two to five times, some up to a hundred times more polluted than outside. You're better off breathing toxic smog in LA than you are in your house. If you live in an apartment that you can't control the airflow, no joke, it's bad stuff, bad news bears in your home. So why is the EPA talking like this? Well, they recommend having a, a, a HEPA purifier. Now HEPA pure, air purifiers are like COVID protocol for hospitals and nursing homes and schools and all that stuff. I actually bought um, air purifiers for our kids' school. Every room in the school have them. Like it's that important. And so, but that research was done a couple of years ago before COVID. And that was 93% of our time spent indoors. What do we know about life since? I mean, we're looking at 99 to 100% of people's time, literally 100%. Some people haven't left their home in two years is indoor. So what are we breathing all day long? Just think about, we, we think about the airborne pathogens. Doc, I've been talking this way for quite a while, almost 10 years. And it, it took COVID to bring a word of awareness that I've been trying to preach for a long time, at least in my life, right? 41 years old, airborne pathogens. People think COVID. No, think the VOCs that are being emitted from your carpet, your cleaning material, think about the aerosols, the fragrances, think about the stuff that's constantly just around you. Like that is public enemy number one. That's the stuff that puts our brain at risk for inflammation and our immune system dampening and puts us um, at, at a slew of host of toxic burden that could be linked to chronic disease. So that if for number one, what's the solution? Well, don't use hand sanitizer. I mean, unless going back to my road trip, right? Lifestyle, my wife and I take with our kids a couple of few times a year. Unless I'm in the middle of the road with no bathroom nearby changing a poopy diaper, I'm not using hand sanitizer ever, like ever. It's not part of my life. 
And you know what? I had to break up with hand sanitizer because I used to be an addict. And I'll admit, I had an OCD years ago. Every time I touched a doorknob, every time I did anything, I had a hand sanitizer. You know what's part of kids' school supply list? Paper, pencil, erasers, markers, hand sanitizer. You can't walk into school without hand sanitizer. So what we do is we make our own, basically an alcohol based with essential oil, done. No toxic chemicals. And, and why this is even more important is not only what the research shares about brain inflammation and a dampened immune system, but how many more products does the FDA have to ban? It just happened again last month. Oh, another one, high levels of benzene, a known carcinogen. You better not use this hand sanitizer. There's dozens out there in the market that are just poison. And finally, because so many people are using them, getting sick and dying, the FDA is finally saying, hey, but what about all the people that have been hurt? What about all the people that, that, that just got diagnosed with cancer? They have no idea why. And maybe it's because a contributing factor could be the hand sanitizer that just got recalled. We need to think twice. And there should be no antibacterial products in your possession, like zero. So yes, this conversation, okay, wow, you just overwhelmed me. My, it's, they're in my food, they're in my air, essential oils, fake essential oils, or ever. What do I do? Where do I start? Number one, you start with your hand sanitizer. And if you have to use it, if you work at a hospital or if your kids need it, make your own. Just get the highest proof alcohol you can. Just whatever, whatever moonshine, vodka you could get at the store, get 15, 20 drops of essential oil, get a spray bottle, bada boom, bada bing, you're done. Like it's so easy. That's, that's, the best hand sanitizer, effective hand sanitizer, it'll kill everything. But here's the cool thing. Besides some dehydrating aspect, and by the way, alcohol will dehydrate your skin, essential oils have what's known as cell selectivity. And again, I have an easy job as a Christian. When I don't understand something, I'm like, hey, it's just the wisdom of God. It's how God created it. Well, the scientists can't explain why. But essential oils target the pathogenic microorganisms and leave the good stuff alone. So we all know about probiotics, good healthy bacteria. If you ingest essential oils, people are ingesting oregano to help cure and repair leaky gut. They're ingesting essential oils or putting them on their skin to kill the viruses and bacteria and fungi. You don't have to worry about ruining your microbiome. That's pretty cool stuff when you think of it. Again, the wisdom of God, science can't explain it. So that's if you need it. But what else, what's another good step? Well, think about your body care and think, because again, we're talking Alzheimer's, we're talking dementia, we're talking you're 41 years old, I'm 41 years old, you're 30, you're 25, you could smell pretty, you could smell good guys, whatever, handsome, good looking, whatever, you could smell good and you don't have to hurt yourself at the same time. No perfume, no cologne, throw it away. Start making your own, start experimenting. Because what do you think are the basis for your perfumes and colognes? Their perfumers are taking the essential oil and then they're loading them up with chemicals and preservatives to give you this like, ugh, toxic. I can't even handle going down the perfume aisle like I used to. I used to love those Aquadigios and Armani's expensive stuff. A couple drops of essential oil. You know what's funny? I'll never forget speaking, uh, a mutual friend, a colleague, Dr. Peter Osborne, functional medicine doc, invited me to speak at a conference a couple of years ago. And I, I flew into Houston on the way to Dr. Osborne's office. And the Uber driver, again, this big, burly Latino guy, he says, man, you smell good. What are you wearing? And I'm like, citrus oils. He's like, what? Boom. Had a cool conversation. I get more compliments from dudes than I do how good I smell. Right? It, it, it's like you smell good, you smell normal, you smell healthy, you smell like we should smell, you smell like nature. Just pointing out, but you know what? I do it in moisture. I, I, my body care. Why am I saying that? Because it's our body care. A little bit of coconut oil, a little bit of essential oil, done. Yeah, you could get fancy. We got all the fun little shea souffle recipes, all that cool stuff if you want to do it. But it's so easy and your body responds so well. Everyone has olive oil or you should or coconut oil in your, in your kitchen. That's it. That's half the battle. So how are we treating? How are we preventing Alzheimer's? It's this lifestyle. And another thing everyone should do, throw away the aerosols. No more poo-poo sprays and plugins. Throw that trash away. And here's the thing. If you're like my wife, I'm sorry. You just got to let go. Throw it away. When I, when I hit my revelation, this was over a decade ago, I'm like, Sabrina, this stuff is bad for us, right? We, we can't use this. My wife's like, we can't throw it. We can't throw, you know, the clean plate club. Like my grandma who came from the great depression, couldn't throw away anything. She goes, we can't throw it away. We can't, we got to use it. 
and then we'll transition out. No, this is poison. We had a little bit of, because she wasn't there yet, right? By the way, if you're a zealot like me, be patient with your spouse. If you're a zealot like me, be patient. Right, that that's that's the problem that we're having right now, especially in the context of the pandemic. We have zealots on both sides of the fence. Be patient with your loved ones, because for me, it's like you know what, it's not going to kill me. I know it's harmful, but you know what, breathing in this thing isn't going to kill me today, and it's not worth a divorce. I, I mean, hey, I'm giving marriage advice here, that which helped me in a big way, because <laughs> if you're gluten free and if your husband's eating pizza and breadsticks all day long, that's going to cause marital problems. That's the number one thing we always get. How do I get my family on board? Because I'm there, and women listening are usually the spearheaders. Women listening, most are just statistically, women are usually the caretakers of the home, and they're the one who get this. It's really hard for men typically to get this stuff right? It's a female dominated industry across the board. I'd like to interrupt this fascinating discussion we're having for another few minutes to tell you about another really exciting product that has changed my life and the life of my family, especially as it pertains to getting good quality sleep. It's something called the Chili Pad, C-H-I-L-I-P-A-D. It can be found at the website, chillysleep.com, which is C-H-I-L-I-S-L-E-E-P.com. And so this product involves a water-cooled mattress pad that goes underneath your sheets and helps you maintain a constant temperature at night. If you've ever gotten woken up because the temperature has uh, change typically goes uh, gets warmer. Um, this product will maintain your body at a very even temperature, and it tends to promote uninterrupted quality um, deep and REM sleep, which is super important for healing and for overall health. And if you um, if you go to chillysleep.com and you use the affiliate code whites. 20, that's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z, 20, you'll get 20% off a chili pad. So check it out and let's get back to this discussion. So, so, so yeah. give me a couple of essential oils we can use as, uh, let's say I have a patient on a functional medicine approach yeah. for dementia. What else, how, what, what are some essential oils we can add to the protocol? Yeah, well, rosemary, the herb of remembrance and going back to herbalism, a lot of those herbs and spices, you know, rose for love, rosemary for, um, you know, again, memory. There's a reason. And our ancestors are very observant, very intuitive. So if you want to help cognitive function, rosemary, you can diffuse it, you can apply it topically, you can even ingest it, it's safe. Um, but cinnamon, believe it or not, and, and I, I don't know how much time you even have to get in depth with this, but, but the primary approach to Alzheimer's treatment is using a drug known as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So a low acetylcholine levels, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain, low levels of acetylcholine is the hallmark sign of Alzheimer's and dementia. And you need acetylcholine for brain synapses and cognitive function, right? So what medicine has done is it's like, okay, we have low levels of this neurotransmitter, so what we should do, according to pharmacy mentality, the pharmaceutical mentality is let's stop the natural breakdown of acetylcholine. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's an enzyme known as acetylcholinesterase. Anything with an ACE is an enzyme, right? So there's an enzyme known as acetylcholinesterase that naturally breaks down the acetylcholine. Well, why would that be? Well, because we're on a cycle. Just like your skin literally regenerates itself every 28 days, everything is being used and built, used and built, used and built, right? And so what the drug approach is to stop the enzyme from breaking down acetylcholine so there'll be higher levels of acetylcholine. Okay, the problem with that, or the, A, it doesn't work, it's not effective, it can't cure the disease, and the side effects are horrendous. I mean, bad stuff, including dizziness, vomiting, memory loss, which is kind of ironic, and death. Well, research has shown that cinnamaldehyde, which is the primary component of cinnamon bark, has an 80% efficacy against acetylcholinesterase. Wow. I mean, you're talking ingesting and inhaling cinnamon bark oil can help my brain function? Wild isn't it? And there are other oils. It, it could also help with blood sugar control because thank you. 
you know, a typical uh, protocol for a dementia or Alzheimer's is going to be a ketogenic diet that tries yes. to control blood sugar. Yes. Yes. And you have um, basil, I'll read a list, um, other oils that are known for their anti-acetylcholinesterase activity. You have uh, rosemary again, sage, thyme, lemon balm, also known as Melissa, lavender, bergamot, and basil, um, and others. So it, again, th this is what I do. I, I go through the research. I share, okay, this is the preliminary stuff. I mean, we have admittedly though, let's be real. We have very little human trials over the course of many, many years to test therapeutic efficacy of oils versus drugs. Like I get that. So a lot of this is quote theoretic, a lot of this experimental, but I'm telling you something, if used properly, there are zero side effects to using essential oils other than the rare case of some sort of allergy. And part of that is knowing what sort of drug interaction might occur if you ingest them. And that's what we include in the book. It's actually the only thing that I think exists for the layperson. And even going through aromatherapy school, there was nothing as in-depth and, and simple to look at as a chart. Like we have this drug interaction chart in the book that says, look, any dr like a drug for Alzheimer's, the drugs for diabetes, the drugs for insomnia, whatever, and say, look, you can't ingest these essential oils or you can have an interaction. Most people don't realize that clove is clove oil is a blood thinner. So if you're on warfarin, you could cause internal hemorrhaging. And the problem is most multi-level marketing companies and other companies include clove in their quote immunity boosting blend. Why? Because clove oil has some of the highest antioxidant Com, um, compound um, um, a, a ability than anything on the planet. Like the ORAC scale of clove is a million. Wow. I mean, a million compared to wild blueberries, antioxidant load of ORAC points of what, five to 7,000. Like we're talking a hundred to a thousand times more potent clove right. oil. So that's what we're dealing with. Again, going back to your herb and spice example, it's like, this is highly concentrated stuff, but you gotta be careful though. If you're ingesting oils, Really make sure you're working with a properly trained functional medicine practitioner, um, someone who understands at the very least who could do a little bit of research and help you. Because if you're on a pharmaceutical, you got to be really, really careful um, with any sort of potential interaction. Now, in your chapter on Alzheimer's, you also talk about anosmia, which is the loss of sense of smell that can happen with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And we also, as you know, um, have a uh, virus around and... Um, and the infection with that virus can lead to a loss of sense and smell. Yeah. Um, is there a essential oil protocol that can help to return the sense of smell in either Alzheimer's or in viral infections or both? It, there's no protocol other than the, the standard of care in, in, in this space is to be stimulating your olfactory nerves on a regular basis that could help very similar to stimulating hair follicle growth to help if you're, if you're losing hair, right. um, by the way, rosemary is wonderful at, at stimulating hair follicles help could help regenerate hair growth. So that's what we try to do is, is I hate to use the phrase, fake it till you make it. But the reality is if you have lost your sense of smell, you want to, can, you want to do what you've always done. You don't want to stop it. Like you don't want to stop diffusing essential oils. You don't want to stop. And, and you might want to even be a little more targeted where you can get an aromatherapy inhaler. And let me pull one up here. You can type, go online, just type up aromatherapy, personal aromatherapy inhaler. This looks like a lipstick or a chapstick tube. And it's just a glass tube with a cotton wick that is saturated with essential oils. And this is concentrated essential oil, but it's personal. It doesn't affect the room. You could use this on the airplane at your, your neighbor next door or right next to you won't smell this, but this is a nice way of getting more concentrated essential oil vapor. And this could help stimulate. You could plug one nostril, breathe in through the other. It's also a wonderful meditative technique for people that are really trying to focus and relax and calm essential oils do wonders with it comes to mental clarity and focus and all that. But the thing is though, I'm glad you mentioned anosmia is because even though you might not, and we didn't even talk too much about mood or memory or emotions, but essential oils work primarily emotion, on the emotional level to stimulate memory. So when you walk into grandma's house this Thanksgiving and you smell turkey and stuffing and cranberry sauce, 
that's going to stimulate hopefully happy memories of holidays in the past, right? Because the the smell triggers a memory in the brain. And you know what happens? You'll literally manifest the same hormone and neurotransmitter production that you did when the memory was made. It's it's wonderful. That's why smelling something can bring you back right there. You're a five-year-old kid sitting on Santa's lap because you smell peppermint and he had peppermint stick smell on him, right? Now, you won't get that. You won't experience that manifestation, the emotional benefit of inhaling essential oils if you don't have your sense of smell. But because essential oils work, regardless if you want them to or not, inhaling certain essential oils like orange, lime, grapefruit will stimulate a production of dopamine or serotonin in the brain. So what am I saying? You use essential oils if you can't smell them because you know that your body is going to respond at least on a physiological level. So on a physiological level, they will respond if you can't even smell you're, you you know you don't have the sense of smell but on a psychological level you won't have any benefit so okay okay i get it and i and it was a shame that all so many people have been affected by covid that way my wife even now her sense of smell has been dampened since covid i mean at one point she couldn't smell anything for a few months um myself included mine went back really quick thank god hers she's still at like 75 percent. she's not at 100 percent yet but we still do what we do and we've had wonderful wonderful feedback from our community members and people that read our books like they follow this like you know what i'm not there 100 percent, but i'm doing a lot better um because sense of smell is so important with flavor with just experience of life especially at the psychological level of enjoying aroma um it's so key um so let's maybe cover one more topic. Um, I was thinking maybe cancer. Yeah, yeah. Um, very respectfully, you know, bleach in a Petri dish will kill cancer cells, right? I, I think it's important to recognize the studies that we have are virtually all in vitro cells in a Petri dish or we're dealing with tumors on animals. We have like no studies, no studies on humans. And, and that's my disclaimer, but... There's a lot of research though, a lot. The talking about specific cancer cell lines and types. And I actually have a chart in the book that covers like the exhaust at a point when we wrote this in 2020, the exhaustive list of all the research done on what specific cancers. And you'd be surprised, you know, you'd be surprised certain. And maybe it's just because that's what the research has done. And that was this, you know, that was just what the researchers felt they should try. But there is, there are very specific oils that seem to have pretty potent efficacy on certain cancers. And so that's a thought is that it, I hope if this is something that you're facing, and again, I don't have an anti-cancer protocol because I don't have cancer. I'm, I'm, I'm not there. But if you do, if you have been diagnosed, working with an integrative oncologist, I think is so important someone, an oncologist who recognizes that there are alternatives that could help. And here's the thing that I want to stress is that there is zero, zero scientific rationale or zero research to suggest that people should not be using essential oils if they're undergoing cancer treatments. And that seems to be one of the biggest misnomers in on conventional oncology is oncologists by and large will just recommend against anything. Like I, 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 I was privileged to and blessed to follow a beautiful young woman and her story overcoming breast cancer. And we created a documentary. And one thing the doctor told her at one point was don't even take vitamin C. And she's like, why? She's like, well, we don't want anything to interact with the chemo and, and make it less effective. Like we are just going to put you in a state where your immune system is just useless, right? It's like, God, like what research? It was fear-based. It's all CYA covering their assets. They're like so fearful of law of malpractice and lawsuits. And so what this woman did, and if you're interested, and if you want a movie that you'll cry to tonight, I guarantee a tear, emotional, this is a documentary. It's one film festival. It was the most inspirational movie of 2020. Um, go to hopeforbreastcancer.com. Go to Hope for Breast Cancer, watch it for free. It's my gift to the world. Just watch it. It's a wonderful film and it's a wonderful story. But this woman, Angie, she started doing things without her oncologist knowing about it. Like, I'm going to use essential oils. She started making her own capsules. Like she, she was telling me the story. Why am I mentioning this? Because this is where essential oils come into play. 
is, is it's not all or nothing. It's, you should never look at your life. You should never look at health thinking I can only go natural or I can only go conventional. Like where's no, there's no balance in that. Like you have to do what's right for you. And, but here's the thing though, regardless of what you choose, you should, and I would encourage you to have essential oils be part of something because they should be part of everything. In my opinion, they should be part of it to help you, whether you're on the all natural route, whether you're on the conventional route or whether you're integrative in the middle. So Angie, her name was from this story. Um, she found herself and I'll never forget this. It's like she walked into the chemo room because she took chemo and um, she ended up stopping earlier on. She didn't take the whole system the whole round and all the, but at one point she walked in around her second or third treatment and everyone around her just pale ash colored skin. They look like death. I mean, e even with her losing her hair, she looked good. Like her skin was vibrant. She had the sparkle in her eye. She was not absolutely just annihilated. She, yeah, she got sick and she had some side effects, but she just pointed out it almost like she almost felt guilty. Like she was going through chemo, like hey, everyone, like everyone else was like barely walking in. And, and, and she accredits that to her natural lifestyle, the food she was eating, the supplements she was taking, the stress, mind, body, prayer, meditation, the essential oils she was using to help. So that's where I want to stress. Like I, we cover cancer very respectfully in the book, no cure all claims. I'm very much in tune and I, I promote I promote because here's, here's a quote. I want to actually quote this from my book from Biomed Research International. Essential oils have been reported to improve the quality of life of the cancer patients by lowering their level of their agony. EO, and just, just that alone, essential oils can be used for improving the health of the cancer patient and as a source of a novel anti-cancer compound. So why did I include this? Well, I hope some brave cancer patient will show this to their doctor and be like, look, you can't recommend me not to take frankincense. This research suggests that it could help me. So you might not want to choose that doctor. If you have a doctor who's just going to say flat out, no, you, you, we need to work with educated professionals who at least will support you in your decision to do whatever it is that you want to do. With that said, and we kind of glossed over this, there's nothing that I know that has such a wonderful effect like essential oils on symptoms, everything, nausea, headaches. Uh, I mean, again, going back to the Alzheimer's chapter, we have this whole chart of, of symptoms that Alzheimer's patients deal with elderly patients, everything from aggression to bed sores, to just, you know, stomach issues, you name it, just dry skin, like essential oils are wonderful at symptom-based management. That's what we focus on in the book is helping people manage the symptoms related to cancer. And there's a ton of them and just what to do and how to consider um, that way. You're not, you know, tempted to maybe go through some pharmaceuticals that will end up destroying your gut lining and making you more immune susceptible to disease and all that stuff. So it, it's a very, I feel it was a very, um, you know, very respectful approach. Again, no cure all claims, but we want to help you. If you're losing weight, you know, there are essential oils to help you. Um, like, you know, if you want to eat more. I mean, that's something most people don't think about. Everyone's in this, I want to lose weight. But if you're cachexic, if you're wasting away, if you are struggling to eat, going back to lavender, those oils that put you in that parasympathetic state will make you want to eat or help with hunger. Right. So that's something to think about. Same thing with bruising and swelling. We have a bruise cream and constipation, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just want to help your lifestyle. And that's it. At the end of the day, you know, we've done I mean, with that documentary, especially walking through and seeing and hearing these stories of these beautiful cancer patients going through what they've gone through. It seems to be the quality of life through the journey that really makes or breaks them. And yes, everyone wants to cure cancer. Everyone wants to avoid cancer. I get that. But what about the process? What about the day-to-day? -day? And maybe your chemo or your radiation or your essential oil therapy, maybe it doesn't save your life ultimately. But if you could do something to give you an extra three or four or five months, would you not want that? And would you would not want three or four or five months of good health and vibrancy and being able to enjoy your family and friends? Like it, it, it's a finite way of thinking to only focus on the end result when we lose today, because all we are guaranteed is today. 
I, I, I can't guarantee you tomorrow. I can't guarantee myself an hour from now. All I have is this moment. And that's really the message, not only the documentary, but it's a message of our whole, our whole ministry is to help people do better in the moment so that you have a more abundant life. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Zielinski. And everybody get the essential oils apothecary. I'm assuming it's available at all the uh, places books are available. Yes, sir. Yes. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. Yeah, everywhere. And for those people who want to take a deep dive, we cover 25 different chronic conditions in depth, in depth, everything from fibromyalgia to insomnia, to um, depression, substance abuse, even libido and erectile dysfunction, like these chronic conditions that are robbing people of the abundant life. We go in depth and sharing you everything that the research suggests on how essential oils can help. If you pick up a copy, we have a gift and you go to eoapothecary.com. And you just sign up for our book bonus gift and you'll get about six and a half hours of masterclass videos for free. Then my wife and I show you how to make um, several of these recipes. And we cover this, these topics more in depth, like heart disease and other things that we just didn't have enough space in the book to cover. So go there. We got charts, PDFs, downloads, all kinds of fun little things. Uh, go to eoapothecary.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Zielinski. Yeah, this thanks for having me, Doc. Podcast. I appreciate you. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you. And see you next week.